you can read a little more and understand. We'll be talking a little bit more tonight, just kind of, um, just kind of me tying up some some pieces that I wanted to touch on tonight. But for this morning, I'm going to do something out of Genesis chapter number four. I'm going to take a look at uh, a very interesting story in the Bible. And actually, if you study the book of Genesis, there's just so much. It's very, very fascinating, and you have to kind of put yourself back in that time in your mind. One of the things that really floors me is that all of this started with God's creation of Adam. But do you ever, have you ever stopped to think about the fact that we don't hear a word from Adam after the fall? There's absolutely nothing in Scripture about Adam other than the kids he had. And then the rest of history begins to unfold all from the kids, the, you know, the children that were brought forth of Adam. But even with Cain and Abel, right? The story of these two sons of Adam. It's not Adam who comes along and says, hey, you know, Cain, you might think about X, Y, and Z. Or you know, we don't have any, I'm not saying there wasn't any of that. I'm just saying the scripture doesn't record any of that for us. So this first family, when you really start to dig into the first family uh, with Adam and his wife Eve, and then they begin to bear children, and obviously there's a lot more children that were born that aren't in the scriptures, but we have at least uh, these that are recorded for our admonition that the Holy Spirit deemed necessary to uh, the story of the Christian faith and to us as well. And so we're going to look at Genesis chapter number 4. And remember what has just happened, right? Adam and Eve, you are, you're very familiar with the idea of the fall of man. One of the most well-known um, events in human history for those who have studied the Bible but to this day, one of the probably least well understood as it relates to the ramifications of Adam and Eve's transgression, right? The fall of man, and so the current condition of man. And so it's, been, it's very difficult for us to grab the scope and scale of what occurred in the Garden of Eden and to appreciate what took place there. But I want you to notice in verse number one, if you'll stand with me, we'll read just a few verses <clears throat> from Genesis chapter number 4 this morning. We read in verse number 1, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And there's a, bit, a little bit of a play on words there. Gotten means to acquire. So she's saying, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she names him Cain, which means a possession, something that she had gotten or acquired by the Lord. And so it's interesting to me also that Eve is the one doing the talking. Right? Where's Adam in all of this? I don't know. He's just, I don't know what he's doing, right? There is no record at all of what Adam did with the rest of his life other than uh, he was spending time with his wife, Eve, bearing children, and then she's saying things about them. And she bare again his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Our Father and our God, we are grateful to you this morning for all of the mighty works that you have done. As we read here an account of an interaction that you had with these first children that were born to Adam and Eve, and we certainly see in them examples of all of us. And Father, we pray this morning that we might not be as Cain, but that we might submit to the revelation of your will, that we might walk in faith, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth as you have called us to do, and that rather than becoming angry, when you point out our sins and shortcomings and failures or correct us, that we might humble ourselves under your mighty hand. Father, I just pray this morning that you bless the time in your word, that you'd speak to each and every heart what is needful for them this morning, that we might be guided and instructed by your Holy Spirit. We ask it to the praise and the honor and glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a lot that I had kind of rolling around in my mind um, that pertains to this particular story in this account. And so I'm just going to share a few of them. And we have, uh, you know, we have a lot to do today, right? We've got a wedding shower and we've got a number of things going on. So we'll try to keep this fairly focused and, and pointed and directed at the matter. 
But I want to draw out something out of this story for our consideration. If you were to just, if you had perhaps a Bible um, that stopped at verse number three, what would you think of Cain? See, this is, we often have the benefit of hindsight. And so we think, oh, Cain, that wicked one. But there's something interesting about Cain. That is, he was experiencing life very differently than we view his life. Right? He's, he's living in a world where he was born into uh, a world where he is seemingly the firstborn of Adam and Eve. Now I want you to imagine growing up with mom and dad, and you're the first kid, and the entire earth is before you. It's all yours. There's no taxes. There's no government. There's no roads. There's no nothing. The only thing there is is whatever it is that you're going to do. The whole earth is what? It's just a fascinating thought to think about what's going on in this period of human history. So Cain comes onto the scene. Now, there's some things that he is confronted with immediately in this fallen world that he is born into. But we often read about Cain and we say, you know, that Cain, as we read in verse number two, he was a tiller of the ground. Now, what might have been the driving influence in that occupation? Because if we read chapter number three, we'll find that Cain is doing the very thing that God commanded men to do. It's actually God who sent man out of the garden to do what? To till the ground. We read in verse number 23, Therefore the Lord God sent him, that is the man, forth from the garden of Eden to do what? To till the ground. That's what he's going to go do. By the command of God, you will till the ground from whence he was taken. And so Cain is born into this world, and they have some things that they are presented with. One is you're going to till the ground. Now, what's interesting about that command is that command falls upon man as part of the curse. As part of the curse. This is going to be necessary to your survival. You're not going to have a life to live if you don't till the ground. Because you're going to eat bread by the sweat of your face. So what I want to think about this morning first is not what we typically jump to, which is the sacrifices that were brought by these brothers. And we will get there. But first, before either of them ever brought a sacrifice... They engage themselves in an occupation. They engage themselves in an occupation. And Cain's occupation was a God-given mandate. And if you were to only have a Bible that went up to verse number 3, you would assume that Cain is the brother who's doing what God said to do. It's just interesting. Abel was a keeper of sheep. There is no mandate to keep sheep. There's no God-given commandment to do that. God didn't say you're going to go forth from the garden and keep sheep. He said you're going to go till the ground. Why is Abel keeping sheep? And why is he considered the righteous one? When he's keeping sheep, and God didn't say keep sheep. I wonder what Cain thought. Cain's the older brother, remember? And he's born into this world. Mom and dad say, son, because of the curse, we're supposed to till the ground. Cain says, then till the ground we shall. And he gets busy. He's a good son. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. There's no, there's no inclination that until he's confronted with the sacrifice he brings, that his countenance falls. He's a good son. He's living out the life he was given under the curse of God and told him, till the ground. So Cain tells mom and dad, I'm going to be the best tiller of this ground. I mean, it didn't take a lot. It's like him, right, and dad. 
I'm going to be the best tiller of the ground there's ever been. I'm going to work this ground like no one's ever worked it. So he engages in good work, God-given work, doing what was lawful and right and commanded of God. So he sets about to till the ground. Now he's the older brother. Abel's born. We don't know how much time goes by. When a little time goes by, here comes Abel. You know, this young upstart. And he sees his older brother. What's his older brother engaged in as an occupation? He's tilling the ground. Why? Because God commanded men to till the ground. And Abel, the young heretic that he was, chose a different path. It's just fascinating. Have you ever wondered why did Abel choose a different path? Why was he engaged in a different occupation entirely than Cain? And why was he engaged in an occupation that didn't have anything to do with the command that God gave to till the ground? Because God had clearly commanded men to be engaged in tilling the ground. You see, there's always a lot more going on in the story than we can understand in the present. But it's really not a surprise that Cain, who's living by the law that God has established, says, be a tiller of the ground, and he's doing that. It's really not a surprise that in the process of time, right? So these young boys grow up, and they begin to have... Uh, what begins to happen with all of us who are born in, of Adam, that as we get older, we develop emotionally and spiritually. They become aware that they too need to bring sacrifices. They too need to worship God. And the very natural thing to do was to bring to God the fruits of your occupation. And it wasn't until this moment that Cain is confronted with a very harsh reality. That even though he's engaged in honorable work, it's good work, it's God-given work, and it's actually work that was commanded to him to do. You would think that he has the upper hand. He's the one doing what God said to do. Whereas he could look at his brother Abel, and God never said, bring sheep. God never, well, God never said, I should say, keep sheep. He never commanded men to do that, did he? Just interesting. So when they bring their offerings, who do you think is surprised? Well, if you were the older brother that was doing, living by the command God gave to till the ground, and you brought the fruit of that effort, would you be surprised if God didn't have any regard for your offering? Would you say, wait, 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 time out, hold on. Because I've probably kind of spurned my younger brother because he's keeping sheep. God never said to be a keeper of sheep. God said till the ground, and that's what I'm doing. I'm tilling the ground like God said to do. I'm, I'm the one that's tilling the ground. And he brings the fruit of that, and God has no regard for that. How do you feel if you're Cain? I can tell you how you feel. The scripture tells us he was wroth, and you would be too. This is how... The human creature responds when God does not regard their effort. Angry. You'd be angry too. Wait a minute. I'm doing what he commanded. I'm tilling the ground. Abel's not tilling the ground. I'm tilling the ground. And I bring the fruits of that. And God has no respect to what I'm doing. And God does have respect to Abel, who chose an occupation that was never commanded to men. Doesn't have anything to do with the, what God told us to be occupied in and doing. It's just a fascinating story to try to put yourself in. If you have a brother, yeah, you've got a brother, and you are a brother, right? Put yourself in their shoes and say, this is what's going on in the family dynamic. Cain is seemingly the one who's carrying out the command of God. We're still not sure what Abel's doing. 
And Cain probably felt that way too. I don't know what he's doing. But I'm doing what the law says. I'm doing what's been commanded. So as we consider the occupations of these two men, I want you to contemplate just a couple of things. Because this, this still is with us to this day. So when you get to the New Testament, and the New Testament says that um, Abel's sacrifice was more excellent than Cain's. Right? That's what Hebrews 11.4 says, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. So in that view, in Hebrews, specifically what's being discussed is the sacrifice that he brought. But as we see from Genesis, the sacrifice, is, the sacrifice was a result of what they had chosen to occupy themselves with. And so, the sacrifice that Abel brought was more excellent than what Cain offered, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. In other words, when they brought their gifts, God testified to both the brothers which gift he would accept. Cain got angry. Now this is interesting because God came personally to Cain. Cain didn't have a Bible like you and I have. See, we all think in our head, if God would just come tell me, I would do it. He has told you. Amen. He has told you. Amen. So don't, let's not kid ourselves. If we won't listen to this, we wouldn't listen to God if he came right down and told us. Because God came right down to Cain. Cain didn't have the scriptures yet. But God came right down to him and warned him of his way. Right? I and mean, that's not the purpose of our sermon this morning. But he warned him of his way and said, If you do well, won't you be accepted? In other words, when Cain was confronted with the reality that this is not acceptable, God says, I'm God, and I will not accept that. And Cain got angry. He didn't repent. He didn't humble himself. He didn't change his ways. He didn't learn anything. He just got angry. Because God said, I won't accept that. So Cain's furious. Because in his mind... It doesn't make sense. He's the one keeping the command. He's the one doing what he ought to do. So he had a more excellent sacrifice, and it was offered by faith. Certainly that's relevant. We're not going to dive into that this morning. Also, we see in 1 John 3.12, these are the two instances where Cain is spoken of in the New Testament, that Cain was of that wicked one. Now, that's not immediately obvious as you begin to get introduced to Cain. Uh, in the book of Genesis chapter 4, it becomes obvious after he kills his brother. Say so that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him, right? Cain is a murderer. So John rightly points out he was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And he asks this question, and wherefore slew he him? And he might gives a very interesting observation. Because his own works were evil and his brothers righteous so the explanation John gives is that the works of these two were different now that's evident in the fact that Cain before he ever murdered Abel this is what John is saying it's not the murder that was just evil he says that he murdered because his works were evil so even though he's doing what God commanded and God said, till the ground and I'm going to till the ground and he's living in accordance with those things that God had established when God confronted him with the fact that I will not accept that. Cain did not repent. Cain did not submit to the revelation of God. Like I said, we have the revelation of God. When you're confronted by God that says, no, 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 I will not accept that. What do you do? Most people do what Cain did. They get angry. They don't change. They don't repent. They don't humble themselves. They don't change their mind. That's what repentance is, a change of mind. The mind is not changed. It is not transformed. It is not renewed. It doubles down in anger and says, I will do what I want. And if God doesn't accept it, 
than tough. See, that's the deal. There is no repentance. So God brings his revelation to Cain and says, I'm not going to accept that. Cain doesn't repent. He doubles down. And oftentimes under the preaching of the word of God, whether it's righteousness or separation, holiness, whatever it is, when people are confronted with the truth of God, what is it? Say, God won't accept that. How do they respond? They get angry. They get angry. I know from experience. So that's the response of Cain. So what is this about? We're taking the New Testament revelation. We say, well, tilling the ground wasn't a sin. There's nothing wrong with tilling the ground. God commanded him to till the ground. So what's the problem? And why did Abel choose, in a, in a pre-meat-eating world, why would he choose an occupation of keeping sheep? They didn't eat meat. It's not until after the flood that they ate meat. So Abel engages in an occupation of keeping sheep, and they're not going to eat the meat. They might have used the skins for clothes, but there had to have be something that occurred. And so this is just the, I'm, I'm setting this up to give you time to think about it. God commanded one occupation, tilling the ground. It was necessary to their survival. You're going to eat of the ground. You're not going to eat sheep. But yet when Abel shows up, Abel says, well, that's great. You're going to eat of the ground. I'm going to go keep sheep. And mom and dad say, well, you can't eat sheep. Or Cain says, you can't eat sheep. And Abel says, oh, I know. Well, then why are you going to keep sheep? What are you going to do with the sheep? I'm going to keep them. Abel's mind is on a whole different track. You choose an occupation based on your priorities. You choose an occupation based on what you're thinking is important. You choose an occupation. Why would, if the whole earth is before you, you're the only two brothers around. You can do anything, you can be anything, it's all yours. What do you want to do? And that's what they chose till the ground, and keep sheep. So these are our brothers. And I'm asking you, why did they choose their occupations? And then secondarily, why did God not have respect to Cain when he's doing the occupation God commanded? Do you see some of the complexity? I mean, I, in a sense, I absolutely understand where Cain is coming from in the sense of, wait a minute, I'm, I'm the guy doing what the Bible says. And yet, right, this is the, this is the plight of the Jews. Yeah. We're the, the Pharisees. We're the ones doing what the Bible says. Look at all these sinners out here, all together born in iniquity. Don't know the law like us. And they're not keeping the commandments like us. You know how incensed they were when the Holy Spirit was given to them and not to them? Cain and Abel is kind of a similar story. Cain was a religious man. We kind of assume that he was just, uh, you know, just utterly reprehensible and, this, you know, just driven out from the face of the Lord. It wasn't until after he murdered Abel that he was driven out. He was a religious man seemingly pursuing God-given commands that he occupied himself with. But there's something missing. There's something different going on that Abel understood that Cain never got. What is it? What's the difference between these brethren? I'm going to set this up with one verse from the New Testament. As Jesus Christ speaks to this in some degree and I'm going to start walking you through what I believe the scripture reveals is the essential difference John chapter number 6 verse number 26 Jesus Christ says this 
Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat that perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. There's probably a lot more here than, than we have time to really get into this morning. But Christ is touching on an essential point. The meat that perisheth is useful. But it's not the most needful thing. It's not the most essential thing. And the way that God has ordained creation is important. As you're seeking the meat that doesn't perish the meat that does perish finds its proper use in place in this life does that make sense there's an orderliness to God's design that says I want you to seek the meat that doesn't perish and as you do that the meat that does perish will subordinate to its proper place but you know what doesn't happen when we're seeking the meat that perisheth, the meat that endures never finds its proper place. It never even makes its way into our thinking. It never enters into our heart or our mind that there is any other kind of meat than the meat that does perish. Not even understanding that the meat that does perish is symbolic. It's a type. It's a manifestation of the spiritual reality that Christ is trying to teach Remember, all through the New Testament, Christ is talking about meat that's not meat, water that's not water, salt that's not salt, light that's not light, bread that's not bread. It means constantly seed that's not seed, thorns that are not thorns, thistles that are not thistles. This is the nature of his speaking and his language. And that's why he's telling the people, how is it that you don't understand my speech? And the people are saying, how could it be that we could understand your speech? It's, it's parables, it's riddles, it's, you know, people act like parables make heavenly things simple. Not necessarily. And so Christ is speaking this way all the time. And he's telling them to not labor for the meat that perisheth. Our focus in life is not to labor for the meat that perisheth. But we do need the meat that perishes as we pursue the meat that doesn't perish. So there's a principle at work here, and it kind of plays into what I want you to think about as it relates to Cain and Abel. Each of these brothers had an occupation, and they chose them based on what they believed was necessary and important. And I think what's, what's important to be learned from Cain and Abel as brothers is that Cain's life, his occupation, it was entirely void of that which was necessary for worship. And Abel's life was essentially wrapped around that which was essential for worship. Does that make sense? God didn't command men to keep sheep. But he revealed to men what was necessary to worship him. And this is the thing. People use this all the time. Well, show me a Bible verse that says that I have to do X, Y, or show me a Bible verse that says I can hear Cain. Give me a Bible verse that says I'm supposed to keep sheep. It clearly says till the ground. And I'm tilling the ground, boasting in that. I'm doing what I was commanded to do. Yes, you must and you should, and that's good. But that is not worship. That's simply fulfilling what was necessary because of the fall and the curse. Laboring to provide for your family is good. It is not worship. Holding down a job 
is good. It is not worship. Making your house payment is good. It is not worship. You know, all of the things that become essential in this life to get by are good. And they are ordained of God. It is not worship. No matter how well you do them. It's not worship. Worship finds no immediate value in this life. Do you understand that? Worship is seemingly estranged from the natural mind altogether because there's no immediate benefit. I'm going to keep sheep, not because I can even eat the meat, but because I'm going to offer sheep as a sacrifice unto God because by faith He has revealed that is how we are to worship Him. There's almost nothing in it for Abel but the opportunity to worship his God the way God commanded worship to be done. Why would Abel keep sheep? Because sheep are essential to the worship of God. Why would Cain till the ground? Because tilling the ground is essential to my own survival. It's a very different mindset that reveals very different hearts and attitudes and minds and priorities between these two brothers about what are they living for and it brings me to this question where does worship find its place in your life where is worship reverence and obedience to God not just by what is commanded and especially not in a way that has an immediate benefit to me but with a gaze that is utterly fixed on the promises he has given concerning that which is to be and knowing that that is what I'm aiming at Abel's not aiming at a great crop and all this bounty and all the things that he can enjoy to satisfy his flesh he's aiming at the worship and glory of God He's aiming at being a partaker of the resurrection. He's looking forward in hope to the promises given to his mother that there would be a redeemer come who would save them, raise them up, and deliver them from their enemies. They knew these promises. They had these hopes. Our gaze is too often fixed on this life and what we want out of it rather than fixing our gaze on Jesus Christ and what he wants out of our life. That's the reality. And that's the story of Cain and Abel. It's good to do all the things God has commanded, but they are not substitutes for worship. So how do you worship God? We're not keepers of sheep anymore. The sacrifice has been made once for all. But Abel knew and understood this principle. That doing what is necessary for worship was far more important to him than doing what is necessary to survival. And he didn't conflate the two. And he has the testimony that God's people have always had that he loved not his life unto the death. So ask ourselves, where's worship today? Where's worship today? It ought to be happening in the lives of God's people. Ought to be happening in the church. You know, there was a time when they called uh, church services worship. And it's good. And it's right that it should be. But how much worshiping is going on? How much worship is happening? when we come into the house of God? Are we offering him the first of everything? The best of everything? The best of ourselves? The best of our attitude? The best of our heart? The best of our effort? Or are we half distracted? Not even contemplating that we're here to worship Christ. And as the praise is going up, 
to Jesus Christ in song. We're chatting with the wife. We're talking with the kids. We're distracted. We're thinking about everything else. We're playing with our phone. We're doing whatever. Anything but singing to lift up our voice that God has given us in praise, in worship. You say, well, I don't, there's no immediate benefit of any of that to me. Right? And this idea of worship needs to be drawn out. We're not going to pursue it this morning. But this morning, I just want to ask you to consider for yourself, how do you worship Jesus Christ? Or are you too busy tilling the ground? Is it all about tilling the ground? Those are all good things. It's not bad. But it's not a substitute for worship. Cain made the mistake of thinking it was. And that's why he brought the fruit of that to God as an act of worship. What did God say? No, 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 no. I'm not going to allow you to worship me that way. You're going to worship me in a way that honors me because there's no immediate benefit to you. Say, well, I can serve Jesus Christ out on the lake fishing in my boat. Sure you can, but not if you're neglecting the saints in the house of God. Because who are you still serving? You're serving me. Well, I'm going to till the ground and all the same fruits that I enjoy and feed myself with. You know that God can just enjoy those with me. He can enjoy all my pastimes. He can enjoy all of the things that God says, no. You're not going to worship me in those things. Those things are not bad in and of themselves. As we pointed out, Cain was commanded to till the ground. It's not a bad thing to do. He's carrying out the command of God. But that is not a substitute for worship. So what is the modern equivalent of keeping sheep? Doing what is good for us that has even been commanded isn't a bad thing. It is not a substitute for worship. So are the things you have chosen to occupy yourself with necessary to survival or necessary to worship? More people pour their efforts into their career and their trade than they will ever pour into their Christian walk. Say, well, I want to get ahead. I want to get this certification. I want to get this license. I want to get this degree. I want to get this credential that's going to advance my career and my standing and my potential to earn money. It's not a bad thing to do. It's tilling the ground. That's not bad. It's good. You ought to do that. But it's not a substitute for worship nor is it the best occupation you could choose. See, that occupation should subordinate to the better occupation. But most Christians have all of these worldly things in view, and there is no place for worship. Cain was of that mind, and then thought, well, I'll bring the results of that as worship. Abel said, I'm going to occupy myself with only the things that are necessary to worship. So I, you could take this and you could, you could begin to unpack it and make it applicable in a lot of ways. But I want you to contemplate these brothers this morning for yourself and ask the question, am I occupied with things that are necessary to my survival or am I occupied with the things that God has revealed are necessary to worship? fascinating story and it plays out over and again throughout the scriptures over and over again and a lot of people I think even have that mentality that well I'm a good person you know I take care of my wife and kids and I do my job well I work hard and God's just going to accept that no he won't Cain thought the same thing it's good to be all those things. And they are commanded. But it is not worship. And it is not a substitute for worship. And that occupation, being so occupied with those things, will not lead you 
to proper worship. Neither will seeking to live by the minimum. I think this is so important. Living by the minimum that has been revealed as a command is not the same thing as worshiping in spirit and in truth. Right? Think about the Pharisees of Jesus' day. They were worried about whether it was lawful to put away their wife. What will the law allow me to do? Fascinating. It's the same principle. Because Jesus Christ, he, the way he answers them, he, take, he shows them, as Paul would say, a more excellent way which is interesting use of language because it's the same thing that's spoken of Abel's sacrifice. He said, yet I show you a more excellent way. What's the more excellent way? Christ says, for the hardness of your hearts, Moses gave you the law. Similar to you're going to till the ground, right? So there's a command that went out because it's necessary to make things work. But when Christ was teaching them, he says, from the beginning, let's look at how it was. In other words, we're going to look at the example. Not the things explicitly given as a command, but the things we learn by revelation as they were revealed by God in the beginning. What was Abel looking at? We don't have any command in Scripture that men were commanded to offer those kind of sacrifices. But God, by example, had shown Adam and Eve what was involved. Why is that important? Because in, in the realm of faith, every time Abel offered a lamb, what's he doing? The same thing faith always does. Same way the ordinances we have today. It reminded him of the grace of God, that God had spared his parents when they were worthy of death. A lot of people miss that act of grace. God said, in the day you eat of it, you'll die. And that's what it, that was the law. When that didn't happen, it was an act of God's grace. God slew an animal, made coats of skins, and covered their shame. So every time Abel offered a sacrifice, what's he doing? He's remembering the grace of God that forewent the immediate judgment that was due and the grace he showed to them as a people. And he's looking forward. right? And that's always what the, the ordinances we have been given do. They remember and they look forward to anticipate the hope of the promises. Cain didn't have anything of any of that. Every time he brought of the fruit of the ground, he's simply reminded of the curse he's under. And that's all that could ever do. So a lot there. Mostly this morning, just some stuff to chew on. But ask yourself this question. Where is worship in my Christian life? How is it displayed? Where is it seen? How would I know it if I saw it? Amen. Brother Adam, if you come, we'll have a verse of invitation as we all stand.